So, hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for being here and I really appreciate it that you uh, rushed so much with your lunch to, to be here. Um, and I'm going to try to make uh, the blood come back from the stomach to the head. Um, so, OpenStreetMap Element Vectorization is a new tool that we developed and uh, I want to introduce you to it. So, um, first of all, where does it come from? So, currently we're running the Ideal VGI project at the University of Heidelberg. And uh, it's a co-project with the uh, TU Berlin. Um, and we, on our side in Heidelberg, are mostly focusing on the OpenStreetMap side. So, we're analyzing OpenStreetMap data and quality. And we're also using the TU results um, as... Um, uh, quality indicators to feedback to the community. And if you're interested in that, um, I had a talk on that and state of the map, so um, you can check that out. Um, but the remote sensing team at TU Berlin is mostly focused on uh, multi-label deep learning. Um, and there's also some uh, things about that in that talk at state of the map. So, okay, yet another tool about OpenStreetMap analysis, right? We have so much already. Um, but of course we have much because we have diverse requirements, right? So we have data creators, we have curators, we have users, we have scientists, and each and everyone needs their own type of, uh, of analysis. We also have very specialized tools currently. So for example, here you can see um, is always and up to date. So that answers this question precisely, or uh, keep right, which ha is a linter that has specific questions that it asks to the data and answers to the user. Um, and of course, we have diverse platforms. I mean, that's the same in every FOSS project or every open data project, that when you, a data is open, everybody can create their tools, and it's great, and they do great stuff, but it also means that you have different ways of accessing the data, different ways of uh, uh, programming languages to access the data. So our goal was to combine and provide to the user what has been divided and conquered. So OpenStreetMap has somehow been divided and in parts conquered, but um, let's get that back, uh, information back. So the main goal is to provide a multifaceted data view. Um, so we want to combine intrinsic and semi-intrinsic uh, indicators on the data, and we call this vectorization, but there are other uh, uh, words for it. So some people call it feature construction. Uh, I think Jennings uh, Anderson calls it uh, embedding. So there are different ways of, of uh, saying it. Um, and we want to enable data analysis with this tool, uh, mostly in the direction of quality analysis, but I will come to it later that it's actually up to you what you use the tool for. Um, and we want to enable machine learning, so we need quantifiable results somehow. Um, and we want it at the highest resolution. So there are tools that work on raster, like uh, um, grid cells or whatever, but we want it on a single awesome object, which is the highest possible resolution. Um, and we, we draw on many uh, knowledge sources. So more than 15 scientific studies and community projects have been uh, analyzed for this project and used. So one is um, actually from, from Peter, um, a study from 12 years ago, year, years ago where he looked at um, the representation of natural features, um, and that is now incorporated in our uh, uh, tools. So we now look at how detailed our objects mapped. But we also use our own knowledge that we created. So uh, uh, that's a paper from uh, last year, where we looked at how are users uh, shaped by mapping in, in OpenStreetMap and what attributes do users have um, when they map in OpenStreetMap. So um, they may be influenced by um, they, where they are, where they map from, where they are actually mapping, so the location that they are looking at, and so on and so forth. And we wanted to provide that information um, for data users. So uh, now let's get to the data aspect. So what are we looking at here? So we have more than 32 indicators uh, that our tool creates and provides and calculates for the user to then later analyze. Um, and these indicators look into many different um, attributes or aspects of the data. So we have the semantic uh, category, for example, object text. So I will not list all the 32, just pick some nice ones. But like, that's an easy one, right? You look at the tags of the object. You look at the geometry of the object. So how big is the object? How long is the line? How, uh, what's the area of the polygon? Um, what's the detail? So how detailed is it drawn? Is it drawn very coarsely or very detailed? Um, and where is it actually? Like um, in what population density is it? I mean, that, that influences the data. I mean, I can't expect many buildings uh, when there is no population, right? Um, we also look at the virtual landscape or um, um, yeah, digital landscape, however you want to call it, like what is the mapping process, uh, progress at the location that the object is? Like, is this fully mapped or are we still continuing to map or is there no data at all and we would expect some? Um, we do look at temporal aspects. We look at the mappers. I mean, this is very important for me as a, as a community analyst or a user analyst um, to have 
this view also in there. Hakli and Zeber called this the epistemologies of uh, VGI. So when we use the data, we not only have the data, but we also have the user that created it, and she or he influences very much what we see, and we have to recognize that. So is she specialized on what she was doing? Like if this is a building, has she ex any experience in, in, in buildings, or is this her first building? Um, is she local to the area? Can she actually draw a building, or doesn't she know anything, and she just drew it from a remote sensing image? Um, and of course, we have an external tools. As I said, we have linters, we have all some nodes, and they may also tell us something about the objects in an area. Um, okay, so this is Phosphorgeza. We have to talk about implementation. And um, it's mainly focused on a Python package. So we, we created a Python package. Um, but Python is actually mostly used for data collection. So we query different APIs, we call different programming language, and we handle all that centralized in, in, in a Python uh, package. Um, and the main GIS work or the main computing, uh, if not done on the server we're calling with the API, is done in our backend. So is done in Postgres um, database or Postgres database. And I mean, at this point, it's, it's time to say thank you for these great tools. Postgres is just an amazing thing to that can replace any GIS tools, in my opinion, or at least for this specific case. And as you can see, the um, workflow is mostly linear. So we were collecting data, and then we we're transforming it, and then we're calculating things on it. Um, so there's not much uh, parallelization currently going on. But um, well, at the end, you get uh, your output from the tool. So how can I use the tool? Um, as I said, it's a Python package. So of course, you can download the source and build it yourself. We're using Poetry to do that. Um, we also provide a Docker setup, so um, if you're uh, aware of that, then you can just get the pre-run uh, uh, or the um, Docker building procedure, and it will set up everything for you. Um, we have a CLI for the project. Uh, project. That was like our main, that we're fo currently main focusing the CLI, so the um, uh, interface uh, in the command line. And, but we're also looking into the API and front end. So we have sent, set something up, and I will show, share it with you later. But uh, it's currently experimental, so please don't crush the server. <laughs> um, so about configuration, I mean, we need to tell something um, before we can use the tool. And actually, only two things are required. So we need a backend setup, and we need a location. Um, and, uh, and a timestamp. So location timestamp, that's required. The backend setup is like your server-side backup. So if you use, for example, in, uh, uh, our front end, then you don't need to, of course, set up the back end because that's what we provide you. But for the configuration, you need where do I want to analyze and at what time, uh, like in relation to what time do I want to analyze it. Uh, but there are many optional uh, things, like, for example, external data sets. The tool is resilient uh, uh, towards missing data. So if you don't have the external data sets we, we would like to analyze, then it would just skip the respective metric. But if you have them, then it will do that metric as well. And well, during processing, I mean, everybody has developed here. So you see that sometimes you have two crashes and you don't want to do it all again. So the tool is actually done in a way that it will catch up from uh, where you left it last. So if something doesn't work, so an API crashes and you want to rerun it a day later, then it will have, still have all the data and will catch up from there. So uh, here you see an example configuration file. And as you see, uh, the most important, let me try the mouse. As you see, the area of interest and the time stamp, those are the only ones that you need to provide, and everything else uh, is optional, um, except for the backend setup, as I said. Um, yeah, um, so in future, we want to work on this tool more. So for example, we want to do more benchmarking. How fast is it actually? We did some benchmarking, but that is quite a while back. Um, then at that time, it took one hour to process 1,000 elements. Um, we have sped up some areas, but we also have introduced new metrics that are very slower, so we don't know what the current time is. And I have to say, benchmarking is really hard on this one because the single OSM element has a huge role on benchmark or on the time it takes. So if a single element has 50 versions and uh, 
50 people that edited it, I need to look into 50 people and edit, uh, look at all the edits. Whereas if it is only one version, it's quite quick. So um, it's highly influenced and it's quite difficult to say how fast is the tool. Um, we need to, of course, test our front end. And we have some ideas for new indicators. There is actually a branch open. I wanted to merge before, but I didn't get to it. So um, look out for that. Um, and certainly, you can uh, currently, you can only process all the indicators, uh, but we want to make it skippable. So if you're not interested in one or the other indicator, then we want to give you the power to skip them. Um, and the quality estimation, I mean, we produce the work for or the tool for quality estimation. Um, so we want to provide you with that. And there, it is currently implemented. So when you, you run the tool, you will get a quality estimation of the object. So how good is the object or how good does the machine learning think is the object? But that's very experimental. And uh, we're looking into that more. OK, let's get into action. Let's see what the tool can do. Let's burn some CPUs. Um, we use the tool for an example application uh, of land use and land cover elements. So that's LULC that you see here. And of course, le land use and land cover um, is because the, our current project is in that area. So it's vital for us. But also we think that this type of information is very important for OpenStreetMap because it kind of makes the map look nice, like it's the background of everything. And people lose it, use it a lot, a lot. Like we have many applications where we use land use and land cover data, not only in our project, but other people use it to train their models to classify our remote sensing data and so on and so forth. So we use 1,000 elements. Um, in total, there were uh, uh, 63 million. So it's only a very small set. But selecting these elements is actually quite not as straightforward as you would think. Um, I mean, you can make a random selection, and that's what we did. We choose random elements, but as you can see on the on the um, on the graph, um, it's first of all um, it, it will highly influence what data you will get. So with this random selection, you will get a lot of objects for these tags that are very common, like uh, naturally equals water is very common, and you will get a lot of lakes in your data set. But there's another dimension to randomness, which is random location. So get me elements at random locations, and that will favor larger elements uh, more. So uh, we choose to look at one dimension first, but uh, we will look into the other dimension in the future. Um, OK, so first of all, I mean, simple thing, we can do hypothesis testing on the data. We now have a multidimensional data set, and let's test some hypothesis. So um, unfortunately, there's a, oh no, there's an image missing. Doesn't matter. Uh, so we have three hypotheses that we claimed uh, that cities are mapped first. Uh, large objects are in less populated areas, so we can't frequently find large objects in, unpopulated, uh, in, in populated areas. And that uh, region gets forest drawn coarsely, but this actually contradicts uh, agent uh, one and two. So this is kind of a complicated uh, relation. Um, and what we actually found is that, well, cities are not mapped first, as, uh, at least if you look at how old are objects in cities. Um, they are actually in relation quite new. So what we actually found is that maybe they're mapped first, but they're also continuously updated. So OpenStreetMap cities are a continuous effort of mapping, and therefore we cannot analyze it in this direction of looking at how all the objects are. Um, what we actually confirmed is that large, large objects are in less populated areas, but the correlation is weaker than we expected. So this is the image you can see actually on the right. Um, that it looks like a, an exploded pillow, um, whereas we expect it to be much more correlated. Um, and the size and age, as we predicted, it has a complex relation, so we cannot have one hypothesis that is true for this one. But of course, this was on a global data set, right? And we all know that global, an global analysis uh, some, sometimes hide uh, regional analysis. So we also looked at regional trends, and we could find that um, object age is actually quite correlated with the region uh, the object lies in. So we have very recent objects in Africa and Asia, whereas uh, Europe and North America have older objects. So we can hypothesize either they are outdated um, or these regions were just mapped first and now uh, maybe mapped better. Um, and we also have to say that, I mean, 60% of the objects we have in our data set or in this sample, in this random sample, come from Europe because that's where most objects are currently in the land use data set in OpenStreetMap. So that also introduces a bias that we have to acknowledge. 
But what we think is more interesting because we have this multidimensional data set is clustering. Um, yeah, so clustering, uh, we did a five, uh, uh, five clusters with the k-means clustering, um, but we had to do some pre-processing beforehand, so we had to cut the range because k-means is um, uh, has problems with uh, uh, extreme values. We had to do some normalization, and uh, that's important, we removed all geographical clues. So any information that was geographical, we removed it so we could see maybe our clusters that are generated from the attributes of objects are actually geo-referenced, so we can find... Geo uh, geographical clusters without actually knowing where the objects are. So that was our interest. And I don't want to get into all clusters, but cluster three really sparked our interest because it's really um, specific. So this is one attribute that we computed with our tool, um, which is the coarseness of the object. So how coarse, how far are individual no uh, uh, vertices of the object uh, apart. And we can see that um, the objects in cluster 3 are drawn with the most detailed compared to the other cluster classes. We can also see that these objects are in quite um, active regions. So how many eyes have actually looked at the region that the object is in? And uh, the objects in cluster 3 uh, lay in ar areas where we have a lot of mappers that looked at the areas or touched the area of the object. We also looked at how complete is land cover in this area and in opposite to what we would expect, if, if we have a lot of members, it should also be complete, but in effect, it's not complete. So we have only little completeness um, in the land cover uh, coverage in OpenStreetMap in these areas. So it's a quite interesting cluster, right? Um, we have old objects, comparably old objects to the other clusters, um, and we have many imported objects. So the share of uh, imported objects uh, is quite high. and. This is all computed through our tool, right? If you run this tool on any object, you will get all these information and many, many more. Um, yeah, and then we get into um, what are these objectly, objects actually? So we have a high share of lakes. I know the color isn't chosen very right, but the green area is, uh, is the lake. So we have a high share of lakes in cluster three and this was not part of the cluster, right? We removed all geographical information. So the cluster algorithm didn't know where the object was, but it still agglomerated all objects in cluster three and uh, from North America into one. So this cluster obviously are some North American lakes that are very detailed drawn, but are in areas with uh, um, less OpenStreetMap information. Um, and so this can be somehow an arch type of OpenStreetMap data that we may look more in, into in the future. So I think it's a very interesting cluster to look into. Yeah, and uh, I want to finalize with um, a call actually to uh, join our path on, on in analyzing OpenStreetMap and looking more into the data um, and using the tool to uh, analyze different uh, objects, analyze maybe object you created last or analyze an area you're interested in or analyze anything. And the idea is really to, we provide the features or the tool provides the features and you bring your labels. So if you have any labels for single awesome objects, then use the tool and it will give you a bunch of features and you can try machine learning. Um, yeah, and you can try the front end. It may not be very performant, try it out. Um, you can see what the data looks like. This is a screenshot from um, how it looks like. You will get a map of the object and some attributes. Um, and also this analysis that we did here is open source, so you can look into it, how we did it and what it's like. So thank you very much.